Hi everyone, uh, my name is Ben Boyd. I was invited to give this lecture um, at the University of Copenhagen in uh, November 2023. Um, thank you for the invitation, especially Sven Froker for organising the, uh, the invitation and it's a great honour to talk. Um, so my background, I'm a professor at the Department of Pharmacy at University of Copenhagen and I also have a joint appointment literally on the other side of the world in uh, Melbourne, Australia and I spend my time roughly 80% in Copenhagen, 20% in Melbourne. And my research is really focused largely on uh, what we call lipids and lipids, the way that lipids behave in the body, so fats, for example, the way they behave in the body and how they then interact with, with drugs and, and become medicines. So uh, milk is an example of that, and that will become hopefully quite obvious by the end of, of this lecture. I started the lecture with a very brief introduction of myself and, and where I'm from and my background and so I did an undergraduate degree and, and PhD in uh, physical chemistry at the University of Melbourne in Australia and I then went into industry for my first job which was with a company called Orica and they were a major explosives supplier for them, well they still are, for the mining industry. So my first job was formulating what we call emulsion explosives and so emulsions I'll elaborate on in the next part of the, um, the lecture but this is really where I got up to, this is a very brief introduction. Good, so for most of you this, the concept of an emulsion is probably not automatic that you would understand. So in the context of explosives, emulsions are the thing that makes money. So there's super cheap explosives and then there's the emulsion based explosives and when the ground is wet, you need to use the emulsion based one. And so there's a whole industry built around making tons of these emulsion explosives and a whole area of technology behind that. And that's, that was really my first job, if you like, in industry. Perfect, thank you. My first job in industry was formulating emulsions for explosives and trying to make them better and do new things. There's a whole I could give a t whole hour talk just on that, but that's not for today. I then switched into the pharma industry, so I went from tons of emulsions overnight into milligrams of drug in emulsions also. Um, but essentially similar ideas of taking self-assembly, and we'll see some of this today, how you can make surfactant systems and lipid-based systems self-assemble and do interesting things. It'll, it'll become a lot clearer what I mean by that in a couple of slides time. I then went to, started at Monash as an academic around 2004 and came to Copenhagen only two years ago. It, uh, it seems like five minutes ago, but um, it has been two years, believe it or not. Sven? Okay, so what am I going to talk about? The first topic that I promised was milk. So I guess the the legal definition of milk is the excretion from a lactating mammary gland. I think we forget that in the context of things that we may consider to call milk at our, uh, oh, yeah, and, and I'll elaborate on, on that in a moment. But essentially, it's all mammals produce milk. As human mammals, we live on it for at least first, or in, under normal circumstances, we would live on it for at least six months of our lives. These ones on the far right, does anyone know? Well, I've got it on the slide actually. So that, that's, they're animals that are known as monotremes. So they're a class of mammals that are essentially prehistoric in the, the genus of, uh, I'm not a, you know, a, um, an expert on animal sort of genuses, etc. But I know that they're much older in the sort of prehistoric, if you like, compared to the current day mammals. But they also produce milk to suckle the young, so the young survive on milk, whereas you know, a reptile doesn't. A reptile hatches out of the egg and it's basically on its own. So there's mammal traits as far as producing milk goes, but they actually lay eggs. So they lay eggs, the young hatches from the egg, and then it goes to the mother's teat and suckles on the milk for a period of time before it goes out into the, into the wilderness on its own. Um, its own adventure. And those two animals are only found in Australia as native species. So not essential for this talk, but I thought an interesting link back to Australia in the context of milk. 
So what is milk as we think about it? So we go down to down to Ferdex and we get our little container of salt milk and that's an emulsion. So it's, it's not white because there are white components in there. So none of the components are white in milk. It's white because we have particles of oil or fat, essentially liquid oil, in dispersed in the aqueous phase. So we've got our fat droplets here. We have protein and some phospholipids that stabilise the surface. Um, we have also some soluble proteins in here and, and other biological compounds. A lot of salt and sugar, obviously. But fat, to me, is the most important component. Now, there's potentially people in the audience and certainly people in the field of science say, no, 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 no. The protein's the most important part. And then others will say, no, no, no. The, the, you know, the glycolipids is the, or the, gly, you know, the, the carbohydrates is the most important part or the glycolipids is the most important part. But the most important part, I think, and I win the argument by sheer weight, is triglycerides. So triglycerides make up 98% of the lipid and fat that constitutes the fat droplet in milk. So that's a huge component in these fat in, in milk. So if we want to understand milk and understand what milk is and what milk does and what milk can do in the context of the second part of this talk, then we need to understand what happens to the triglycerides, not in the bottle because you know, dairy science has studied that forever. What we don't know a lot about is what happens during digestion. We know we can anticipate what the chemistry is. So we know that when we drink milk or we eat a dairy product, that the fat droplets are digested. And so the triglyceride that makes up by far the most of the fat component in that food are not absorbed intact. So although the food, the lipid in the food is mostly triglyceride molecules, our body can't absorb triglyceride molecules intact. So our body's designed or has this system of digestion that breaks down triglycerides down to what we call a monoglyceride. So that's when we have a fatty acid here and a glycerol backbone and two fatty acids. And so the lipases, so you may have heard the term lipases, they're an enzyme that's in our three parts of our digestive tract actually. So there's some lingual lipase in our mouth that contributes almost no quantitative digestion. Gastric lipase in our stomach contributes maybe 20% of the total amount of digestion of lipids in our, in our gut. And the pancreatic lipase, and this is why I put it in the largest font, is the most important, at least in terms of uh, digestion of triglycerides, because that contributes probably 80% roughly of the digestion and so that most of this digestion happens in the small intestine. So the pancreatic lipase is excreted into the small intestine. It then does the job of breaking down the triglyceride into monoglyceride and two fatty acids. So that's chemistry lesson one for the day if you're not familiar with what happens to fats when we eat them. And so these triglycerides then, which are th just three fatty acids linked on a glycerol backbone, they can have, there's many different fatty acids that might constitute that triglyceride, an individual triglyceride molecule. So because there's hundreds of different types of fatty acids, that makes for thousands of different combinations that can make up triglycerides. So it's a very complex mixture of triglycerides, but there are some commonalities as we'll see. So, um, so our body breaks down the, the triglycerides into monoglyceride, and two fatty acids, those units then are able to be absorbed. And it's directly analogous to protein digestion, breaking down protein into amino acids, because whole proteins are not absorbed quantitatively, at least, by our gut. The, mono, the amino acids are. And carbohydrates, intact large carbohydrates, also are not absorbed quantitatively in our gut. They're broken down into the individual sugars. And so so there's direct analogies there um, with, with lipids and the other component, major components in our diet. So, so that's, that's interesting, but then I would say then, then the magic happens. So from a physical chemist's perspective, so my background's in physical chemistry, I want to know when we have these individual components here, so we've got a triglyceride which is extremely non-polar, so triglycerides are not soluble in water, but then you break 
those triglycerides down into more polar molecular components. And so perhaps then some interesting things start to happen. So this goes back to my academic heritage. And so Tom Healy was my PhD supervisor's PhD supervisor. So he's my academic grandfather. His distant academic grandfather's grandfather, I think, was Arrhenius. And so there's a direct lineage of physical chemistry there. Um, and he's pictured here with Jacob Israishvili. So Jacob Israishvili is a physical chemist of many talents. Um, he passed away only a couple of years ago. But his, one of his main, well, one of the areas that I was specifically interested in that he was known for was developing a theory about what happens with lipids and with surfactants when you put them into water. So we know they interact with water because some are soluble, some are not. Some do some really interesting things. And so if we have non-polar substances that are liquid at room temperature, then they'll just, and not soluble in, um, in, in the water, then they'll just form an oil droplet. We know that, so it's like an oil slick um, if, if it's not, not miscible with water. But if you start to form or break down these triglycerides to form more polar lipids, then what happens is we end up with, it's, it's a bit like a spectrum of what we'd call self-assembly. So the lipids don't just sit there and stay as a, an oil droplet, even though they've become a monoglyceride and two fatty acids. They actually start interacting with water. So we've got head groups of those molecules that now want to interact with the water. So if we've got, if we start at this end, so this is when we have very polar molecules. So this is like our liquid detergent that, for doing our dishes. So we'd have perhaps a you know, sodium dodecyl sulfate for the chemists in the audience. A very polar surfactant will self-assemble and form micelles. If you have a lipid with an in-between polar and non-polar character that's perfectly balanced, then geometrically, the head if the head group is kind of similarly interacting with water as the tails are not, then you get a balance and you end up with a flat sheet here. So this, we can I've got, conveniently have a pile of paper here, which I wasn't by design. Um, and you can imagine those, what we call a lamella structure or a bilayer structure, which you may have heard that terminology in the context of membranes. So if you have a membrane, essentially, so phospholipid membrane, then if, if that's perfectly balanced, then we'd have our flat membrane and we have water on top and water on the bottom. But you can imagine if we start to put more hydrophobic compounds into the space in between these perfectly balanced phospholipids, so let's say we put some fatty acids in there, that'll start to change the, the curvature of the lipids. They don't want to pack flat anymore. If they're more hydrophilic, then they'll be starting to head down this direction in the spectrum. But if they're hydrophobic or if they're protonated, so they're not particularly polar, then they'll, then they'll start to push the, the behaviour in this direction. And then interesting things start to happen. So for example, if you have that flat bilayer and you introduce some hydrophobic compounds in, then it'll start to twist. It doesn't want to be flat anymore. It'll start to twist. It doesn't really want to rip because there's a huge energy penalty for that to happen. And what'll happen is it'll twist and twist and twist and twist and twist and you'll end up with, it's still a bilayer, it's just that it's changed its conformation in space. You've got, still got water on one side, water on the other side. It's exactly the same thing. It's just slightly twisted in terms of geometry. And so, so Jacob Isfus really had this theory that, okay, it really just comes down to geometry and packing. So we could almost predict what surfactants and lipids are going to do and their interaction with water and what structures are going to form if we understand and just simply think about geometry and if we've got a more bulky hydrophobic molecule with a little head group, then we're going to push the molecules apart and vice versa if we have a big hydrophilic head group and a small tail, then we'll tend to push things in this direction. So that's, that's hopefully given you some familiarity or some anticipation that we may be into going to see some interesting structures and things here. So, so this screwed up structure, is what, it doesn't look like a cube, but if depending on how it twists, you can actually get highly ordered 
structures form within this, essentially think of this now as a fat droplet. So if this started out as triglycerides, there'd be no structure. But if we introduce these other lipids, then we would expect that there will be some structure to that, to that droplet based on what we see here. And I'll elaborate on that as we go through. So, so we expect then, as we go from a triglyceride oil, and if we then think about digestion, and the fact that we're producing more and more hydrophilic compounds, so we're going down this trajectory towards the monoglyceride and fatty acid, then we would expect to go from unstructured fat droplets through these, essentially the spectrum of structures that we see in this diagram as we head from here in this general direction. So we might expect to see what we here we call this an inverse micellar cubic structure. You don't need to get the terminology at this stage, this is what we call a bicontinuous cubic structure. This is an inverted hexagonal phase structure. And so we would expect to see these structures evolve as we go through the process of digestion if this theory is correct. In order to do that, we need to somehow measure what structures we have. And we need to measure it in situ during digestion on a time scale that makes sense for digestion. Preferably we'd do it in someone's small intestine to absolutely prove the point. We may not be quite there yet. Um, but in terms of at least an in vitro experiment, then there's been this model around for, for quite some time that food and pharmaceutical industry uses to, under, to try to understand what happens to components during digestion. So this is like an artificial gut, essentially. Um, and so we have our reaction vessel here. and It's just a reaction where we use pancreatic lipase to stimulate, or we could use gastric lipase as well, or we can do sequential gastric and then intestinal conditions. And we can mimic the conditions that are in the gut. Um, as, we, as the digestion proceeds, we can monitor the kinetics of digestion with this model. I won't go into the chemistry details, but we can access the kinetics as we have digestion occurring. The problem is that, that then we can take samples, but we don't really have structural information. We don't have a mechanism for measuring what structures are there. We can, we can put it into solvent and destroy the enzyme to stop the reaction or put it in an inhibitor, but, and we can access compositional information, but we can't access structural information. So one of the techniques that I've spent my academic life working with is this technique called small angle X-ray scattering. And so hopefully you've all heard of x-rays, probably wouldn't be sitting in the audience now if you hadn't, to some degree. And so if we take x-rays and we impinge them on a material, then if the material has no structure, then some of the x-rays may be absorbed, but most of the x-rays will just go straight through. That's like soft tissue in, a, in an x-ray of a broken arm. Okay? So soft tissue, the x-rays go straight through. Hard tissue, the x-rays are absorbed. So bone, the x-rays are absorbed and you get contrast that way. But if you have an ordered material, then you get an interesting interaction of the x-rays with the structure and you'll actually get x-rays get diffracted at angles that are characteristic of that structure. So I'm not going to go into the fundamentals of x-ray scattering other than for the sake of this talk, you just need to understand that it gives us like a fingerprint, if you like, for different structured systems. And so drug, ordered drug crystalline material has X -ray, a characteristic X-ray diffraction pattern, but so does ordered lipid material. So if we now have this cubic phase material and we put that in the beam and we send X-rays through, then we'll get X-rays diffracted at a characteristic, characteristic angle that depends on the structure inside this material. So the x-rays will come in and they won't go, a lot of them will go straight through, but many will be diffracted at an angle that's characteristic of the, of the underlying structure or the internal structure of that droplet. And so if we have this bicontinuous cubic phase, which was on the left side of the sort of hydrophobic part, we had the lamella one here, that has its own characteristic diffraction as well. Um, but the, the ones of interest specifically for this talk, cubic phase, inverse hexagonal phase and this inverse micellar cubic phase, they all have different fingerprints, different diffraction patterns. 
So if we then take our x-rays and shoot them through a sample that's digesting, we should be able to tell if we're seeing that, if we're sort of seeing transformations between those different structures as we might anticipate as we go from hydrophobic lipids to more polar lipids. If, if they self-assemble and form those particular structures, and if it's in the order that we would anticipate from the critical packing parameter, then we can use X-ray scattering as the diagnostic or the, the measurement for that. So what then becomes critical to this story is that if you try to do these measurements on a lipid-based self-assembled system, even on the, some of the best instruments, the best one now is in, at ILF, which actually can probably do this in real time, but that's probably the only instrument that I've encountered that can probably do that. Um, most instruments you require at least 30 minutes acquisition. So the X-ray scattering instrument that's in the basement of this building, that would take probably an hour to get this sort of information and then, then it would still be not very good resolution. So digestion takes place on a much faster timescale than that. So we can't use a lab-based X-ray instrument to do these measurements. But luckily, and this was part of what drew me to the position here, is that in Melbourne also, but at, in Sweden and Lund, we have a what we call a synchrotron source, and I'll elaborate on that in a moment. And we can get access this information on millisecond timescales if we use the X-rays that a synchrotron can produce, which are very, very high flux and high intensity x-rays. So, so this is the MAX4 lab in Lund. So we can now think about taking milk, for example, over the bridge, take our enzyme over the bridge, and take our little in vitro lipolysis model over the bridge, which we do in a plastic case. And we fit this in vitro model now with a flow through loop. So now we have milk going round the loop goes through a capillary and we then use the super intense x-rays to probe what's happening inside those lipid droplets during digestion. So we introduce our enzymes and the first time we did this I didn't think we would see anything to be honest. Um, but the best experiments at the synchrotron happen at 2am in the morning and lo and behold what we see if we put milk into into this in vitro digestion system. So this is just at the start, it sees featureless emulsion, essentially there's no internal structure to the fat droplets because digestion hasn't started, it's just liquid, liquid fat droplets. But we quickly see that we get different structures forming. So see this peak here and this peak here, this peak here, they're disappearing. They were the fingerprint for this inverted hexagonal phase and we, so I'll let it run again. Um, It'll take a few seconds for it to restart, I think. Here we go. So we see, we start to see a peak produced here. This is actually fatty acids interacting with calcium and forming a, what we call a soap. Don't worry too much about that in this instance. That'll, that'll happen anyway on the side. This little peak in here is accompanied with another one up here that's disappeared. That's this structure here, this inverse micellar cubic phase structure. So the droplets had that on the inside. Then it, that, that disappeared and it formed hexagonal phase structure. That then disappeared and it formed the bicontinuous cubic phase structure. So did anybody have a cup of coffee this afternoon? Anyone? I had at least two or three. I have mine black. But if you had it with milk, then the lipases have taken your, the fat droplets in that milk have started to break them down to form fatty acids and monoglycerides. And at the end, so this is the end point here. So we've digested 95% plus of the triglyceride at this point, and we know that from the profile from the in vitro digestion model. Um, at the end point, we've produced these structured fat droplets. So the fat droplet that was in your gut, as long as all things being equal, the gut's similar to our in vitro model, then you've generated those little fat droplets. I don't need that anymore. Thanks, Ben. <laughs> so, so this is just a contour plot of that video. So this is time going backwards here, so increasing time of digestion. And you can see that we, 
have these different structures form and then they disappear and these other, this other structure forms which happens to be this bicontinuous cubic phase structure. So, so that's, to me that's fascinating. I don't know if anyone else finds that interesting. But if the rate of, so you can, okay, so lipids get absorbed so maybe it's more complicated than that. It is, but the rate of absorption has to be slower than the rate of generation of these lipids because they have to be formed in order to get absorption. And so as long as you have a high surface area and you're getting effective digestion occurring, we anticipate that we would be forming these types of structures even in our gut. So um, the proof that there's cubic phase there, so this is cryo-TEM, so this is a high resolution liquid, vitrified liquid microscopy image that just shows that we actually have or gives us an additional proof that we have this cubic phase structure there in these droplets. So I can summarise about three and a half years of work to say that if you take mammal milks, if you accept that as a definition of milk, and monotremes presumably, I haven't done platypus milk or echidna milk, um, it would be interesting but it might be hard to get enough to do our experiment. But we've done all these other mammals, uh, this is my niece, Raven, who lives in the US, she's 12 now, that's how long we've been doing this for. Um, they all self-assemble to form these self-assembled structures during digestion. We've measured them all. What about the other stuff? So what do you think I mean by the other stuff? So of those people this afternoon, and you have to be honest here, of those people this afternoon who had the coffee, did anybody use one of the other drinks, like soy drink or almond drink? Or No, everybody used effectively saw milk or low fat. Very good. Um, well, good or bad, I don't know. But it's, obvious, it's a very timely topic. There's a lot of discussion around this topic about what is milk, essentially, and, and is marketing actually getting in the way of reality. So you'll have all seen this explosion of these things on the shelves in the supermarket. Um, there's some really strange things in here. But in Australia, and I suspect in the EU, you are, you're not legally allowed to call something milk unless it's the product of lactation from a mammary gland. And to my knowledge, none of these are. Unless it's a very weird mammary gland. So. And, they're, and they're, unashamedly they call themselves milk and other variations on the, the word um, and they get away. This one's pea milk, believe it or not. There's also potato milk I've seen now in the last few months has emerged as a, the latest trend. So we have all of these things that are marketed as milk. So now we've seen what mammal milks do. Is it specific to mammal milks? Or does any white liquid form these cubic phases and it doesn't really matter what it's made out of. So if we take soy drink and we digest soy drink in exactly the same model, under exactly the same conditions, exactly the same total fat content, this is almost complete digestion now. So you don't, so the lipids are different. The lipids, the, the Composition of the lipids doesn't support the same types of self-assembled structures that form during the digestion of mammal milks. They digested, so we, we know that they're digested from our titration profile, so our digestion kinetics profile from the model, but they don't self-assemble in general to form those highly ordered diffraction structures that we saw with the mammal milk, bovine milk and with other mammal milks. Um, I'm not going to show them all in the interest of time. You'll have to believe me that they, the mammal milks all do form those different highly ordered structures. Um, they tend to be different because the lipids' compositions are slightly different. We'll come back to that. But these things do not form the same sorts of structures. So what other sorts of materials might we want to know about in this context? So infant formula where does that fit? So infant formula is marketed as a substitute for mammal milk, unashamedly, right? we see here. 
learn from the breast. Now, I would like to know how much they've learned. They certainly haven't done a small angle x-ray scattering experiment to understand is it similar to breast milk or is it actually completely different? So what do you think the answer is? Do you think it's similar to breast milk or do you think infant formula is very different? Well, the answer is it matters which one. So four off-the-shelf infant formulas, and I won't, I'll won't. i protect the innocent by not saying which ones they are, um, but we can see here, so this one, and I didn't show the diffraction for uh, human breast milk, but this one is very, very close in terms of behaviour to human breast milk. This one is a bit closer to cow milk, it forms this inverse hexa inverted hexagonal phase. It doesn't form cubic phase at the end, but it's getting, it's, it's reasonably close. These two behave just like the vegetable oils. And we, we know we can do lipid analysis from these things and you don't need to understand any detail here other than that they're all different and the colours are all over the place. Okay? And what that's telling us is that the fatty acids and the monoglyceride compositions, when you've di digested these things, so we've digested them completely, we then measure just using lipid analysis, what the different chain length monoglycerides and unsaturation of the monoglycerides is between them, at least of the most common lipids that are in there, and they're, and they're all essentially different. There's some commonalities, so the mammal milks all tend to form monopalmitin as the monoglyceride, and I'll elaborate on that in a second why that's so. Um, so that scramble of lipid data and again, I won't dwell too much on this slide because I need another hour to explain it in, in detail. But if we take that lipid analysis data and we then start to ask the question, is there patterns of lipid composition that would dictate that we're going to form certain types of structures, then we can do what we call principal component analysis, which is really just compares data and says, is it similar or different? And so if we do that, then it turns out that, so this PC1 score here, um, if we're in positive PC1 space, then that tends to indicate that we're likely to form inverse micellar cubic phase structures. The lipid compositions that would give us a positive PC1 space favours monopalmitin in the middle and unsaturated oleic acid and linoleic acid on the outside. And that's at, to a degree a self-fulfilling prophecy because human breast milk we know contains a lot of triglyceride where we have palmitic acid in the middle and oleic acid or linoleic acid on the outside. So this, if you're familiar at all with this area then the triglyceride that all companies aim for is OPO which is oleic acid, palmitic acid, oleic acid in that triglyceride. And that, so that, that, but that's telling us that that's, that actually is a, an indicator that we've probably got that lipid composition. And we've gone away and looked at those infant, different infant formulas and I can tell you right now that the ones that look like vegetable oil is no coincidence because they're basically emulsified canola oil with a bit of protein thrown in on the side. As are a lot of the vegetable drinks. They're a canola oil base emulsified with a bit of phospholipid and then they put in the protein from the plant of interest to say whatever your favourite plant is that's in there to make you feel good that you're having your potato milk because you don't like almonds or something. So it's I think in about 30 to 50 years the world's going to look back and say what were they thinking with these different drinks because the, the marketing is a bit misleading. Nevertheless that's a story for another day. So the first part this is the end of the first part about lipids. Hopefully I've shown you, so milk's not a passive material. During digestion interesting things happen. So we get this interesting self-assembly phenomena that actually was predicted 30 years earlier. I should have highlighted that paper was from 1976 when Jacob Velashvili predicted this critical packing parameter theory and it's taken until our experiment digesting milk and doing the in situ scattering to actually validate it in a, in a real sort of natural uh, system. And um, the vegetable drinks don't really behave at all like the mammal milks, infant formula is somewhere in between. Now this will become important in a second 
when I talk about the second part, um, is that they, the infant formulas are all different, right? Um, you could argue that the structure could give you an extra definition of what is milk, because all the mammal milks that should be called milk, legally, and possibly intuitively, all have this type of behaviour. Um, we're still working on the reason, and I'm happy to take questions on that at the end. So, as Sven said, I'm from the Institute of Pharmacy. I have to have something about drugs in here. So the second part is about lipids and drugs. And it's also about milk and drugs, and it's also about infant formula and drugs. So this is really just to set the scene. And again, you don't need to be an expert in drugs and drug development to get the context here. Um, the context is that, so drug properties determine how we make them into a medicine. So message number one, if you're not from the pharma, pharmaceutical field, a drug is a molecule. It's not something that helps somebody to address a condition. A lot needs to happen between finding a molecule that in a cell-based assay gives an indication that it might have a therapeutic effect to then being a product. And usually the end part of that is what we call formulation. So what do you have to put in with the drug to enable it to do what it needs to do in order to have the effect that you want it to have? And so if we think about drugs in development, then we have a little bit of a problem because even in the era of these fancy mRNA drugs, which are highly water soluble, um, so they'll fall down in this sort of camp down here. They're highly soluble, but they're not permeable. So in other words, they don't tend to get absorbed in the gut. Um, so that's why we have to have an injection for an mRNA-based drug. Um, so these drugs up in this corner don't want to dissolve in water at all often. So we're talking microgram to nanogram per mil solubility in aqueous environment. But they might be super soluble in lipids. So 50, 100 milligram per gram or more. So they're lipophilic drugs. They like to dissolve into lipids. And the consequence of that is that they, they won't dissolve. If we just give the drug as a lump of drug or in a tablet without any help, then that drug won't dissolve in our gastrointestinal tract. There's not enough capacity to dissolve the drug for it to be then absorbed by the body and have its effect. So for those sort of drugs, we have a problem because we can only, at the moment, we're not very good at translating them into products. So 70% of the drugs that are discovered have those sort of properties, but only 30% of them end up as products. So we're actually losing a lot of potentially useful therapeutic molecules because we don't formulate them well, or we don't formulate them well for the population, or they have other liabilities. So undeveloped drug candidates increases the overall cost of new medicines. Most drugs are soluble in lipids, uh, more soluble in lipids than in aqueous media. So how do we solve this? Any ideas? You could take them with something. So you could think about actually taking them with milk. And even though you know, the, the mantra of take your drug with a meal has been around forever, you, you'll be surprised in a moment at how little we've kind of exploited that, that mantra. Part of the problem is take your drug with a meal. So I used to be a lot bigger than I am now. Um, so my meal back in the day may have been two Big Macs and a large fries. And then someone else's meal was a lettuce leaf and hopefully a little bit of salad dressing maybe with some fat in it. And you can imagine that if, you worry, if, if the lipid is important in dissolving the drug, then you'll get a very different outcome between those two extreme scenarios in terms of what does it mean to take your drug with, um, you know, with a meal. Maybe milk can help us out a little bit. Um, so milk lipids might act as a lipid formulation. So these drugs like lipids, milk is made of lipids, then maybe that's part of the, part of the answer. Um, it's also, if we think about it, quite good for children and, and for elderly people. So those populations in particular often can't swallow tablets. So normally we can, we're happy to swallow a tablet as, a, as an adult patient or a capsule. Um, so we could incorporate our components into that if we need to, to, to help the drug to get dissolved. And there's a whole pharmaceutical science course on that. But for children and elderly, usually a liquid 
formulation is required. So the drug either needs to be dissolved in the liquid or dispersed as a, what we call a suspension, so solid particles in suspension. Milk can be quite useful as a vehicle for that. Um, and then in the context of what I've shown you in the first half, we would actually hypothesise that it's less important to know what the solubility of the drug is in milk and milk lipids before digestion. It's much more important to know the solubility of drug in those digested lipids immediately before absorption. So we want to get drug in the best possible situation where it's completely dissolved in the digested milk, so then it's all available for absorption if it wants to be absorbed. So if it has enough permeability, then, then it can be absorbed en masse. So we need to understand whether the drug will dissolve or precipitate during digestion. So we, if we take our drug, whether it's, it could be tablet and a glass of milk, or it could be a formulation of drug in the milk, if the drug's dissolved, then that's good if it stays dissolved, but it might actually want to precipitate because of the process of digestion. If it's less soluble in the products of digestion than it is in the starting lipids. The opposite is also true. You might have a drug that's not soluble in milk really at all, but during digestion, then if that environment's much more favourable to dissolve the drug, that's going to be a good thing because then your drugs are dissolved after digestion and ready for absorption. That's the case that I'm going to convince you of which is important in the context of this. This, uh, this lecture. So we're not the first ones to think about milk as a lipid formulation, but we are definitely the first ones to think properly about it in terms of digestion. And digestion getting drug in, as a mechanism for getting drug into solution and making it bioavailable. So what happens when we take drug with milk and digest the milk? So it turns out that we've got a really nice technique called small angle x-ray scattering, but if you go to slightly different angles, where we might be tempted to call it wide angle scattering, it's not really super wide, but drugs will have, themselves will have characteristic diffraction patterns if they're solid crystalline drug. The lipid, the scattering I showed you from the lipid would be over here. So it's a, the same measurement, it's just at different, different angles. And that's extremely convenient because now we can take exactly the same setup, go over the bridge, take our milk, take our pancreatic lipase, take our box with our apparatus in it, and also take drug with us. And then we can combine drug, let's say in this case cinerazine is a poly soluble, classical um, poly soluble, highly permeable compound, and we can put it in milk, and it turns out it's, it doesn't really want to dissolve into milk. So if we crush up a tablet of this drug or we start with the powder, we disperse it in milk, we put it into our artificial digestion system here, flow it through the capillary, then we can take the diffraction from the solid drug and if that disappears, then that's telling us that the drug is dissolving during digestion. So if we go back to the graph over here, the cinerazine is not soluble in undigested milk. So, that, so it won't be absorbed. Drug has to be in solution to be absorbed. Number one, I think I had it on the previous slide maybe, number one sort of tenet of pharmaceutics if you like. The drug has to be in solution to be absorbed. So if the drug's not going to dissolve in undigested milk, if the, drug, if the milk's not digested, so if it's a formulation that doesn't get digested, then you won't, you won't be in the best situation to get um, complete or complete um, absorption of the drug. You might get a little bit of absorption, but usually low, um, lower than what you need to get a therapeutic effect. But as we can see, as the milk gets digested, then we get this complete solubilization of the dose of the drug during the digestion process. So this data comes from tracking one of the characteristic peaks, probably this one. So the disappearance of this peak over time during the digestion process. So that would then indicate this is a really good formulation for using in this context. So it was about this time we developed this capability and we were actually looking for a serious problem to solve. And through a circuitous route, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation came to us and said, there's some unfortunate facts here. Um, 
we have this single potential single dose cure for malaria and we've done a stack of clinical trials um, with this combination. So there's two drugs, so you'll see the structures in a minute if you're interested in structures, but OZ439, otherwise known as artifenamol, and ferroquin. So these two drugs, if you have them in the right ratio and get sufficient absorption of both, will give a single dose cure for malaria, at least in mice. So then that progressed to clinical studies and they tried a wide range of different formulations, so different ways of getting the, I should say that both of these drugs are poorly soluble drugs. Um, they tried a wide range of formulations to get them into solution and the only one that worked for them to get sufficient exposure was if they gave it with milk. So two drugs, glass of milk, sufficient absorption in a pharmacokinetic study would predict an efficacious outcome and a, a cure for malaria if you like. And that's super important in the context of paediatrics and sub-Sahara low economy type setting because we can take, if we get malaria, we can take a course of tablets that will kill the parasite and then we're okay usually until we have another exposure if we go back to wherever we got the malaria from. Um, but in Africa, parents will often sell the medication if it's a repeat course or it's hard to have the communication to, that a course of medication can be given. So, so it's a big problem. So they gave us a relatively large amount of money to go away and explain why that clinical trial was the only one that worked when you, they used milk, but also what options do you have for a, for a formulation um, that's not milk, and I'll elaborate on that in a moment. So first question, do OZ439 and ferroquin dissolve during the digestion of milk? So we already knew the answer, but we had to show them why it worked. And so we can see here, ferro this is a structure of ferroquin. If you just stir that in milk, it doesn't dissolve. So this is the clinical dose in a glass of milk, 200 mils of milk, clinical dose of the drug, it doesn't dissolve you then digest that milk, it completely dissolves. So it goes into milk beautifully um, during digestion. The other drug, um, OZ439, I won't elaborate on all of this, but the upshot here is that you get a couple of conversions, so you get some polymorphic transformations of the drug into different crystal forms. But you could only detect with this in situ X-ray scattering approach. Turns out you actually never completely dissolve a dose of the drug in milk. It just kind of tails off. We've never seen it completely digest um, in milk, at least when you've got the clinical dose and, and regular fat milk. Um, so it's not an optimal formulation, but it works. You get enough dissolved and absorbed to get the plasma levels that they would anticipate would give a, a single dose cure. So milk doesn't work optimally. And milk has other liabilities, so milk, so availability of milk, stability, consistency, quality, there's many reasons why milk would be very bad as a pharmaceutical ingredient. You'll never get it through the formal regulatory process. Whereas infant formula, on the other hand, is a highly regulated, consistent, acutely safe product. And um, so we suggested going away and looking at different infant formula and understanding could infant formula substitute for milk? And if so, how much drug to fat ratio do we need? And can we exceed, actually exceed the performance of milk in that context? So if we do that measurement, so now we're just going to look at end point of digestion. Don't worry about the kinetics for this last little data set for the, for the session. So at the end of digestion, when we took ferroquin, and digested it, there was no crystalline ferroquin left when we digested it in milk here, okay? So there's none here, that's this data point that's dashed line across here. So it would be fall at about 3.8 to 4% fat, normal milk. Turns out with three different infant formulas, three different fat contents, ferroquin's all completely dissolved. So the infant formula can substitute perfectly for milk and dissolve a dose of ferroquin if we were to go down that, that path. The problem arises with 
So there's a, there's a data again. So the problem arises with the, what we call the problem child, so OZ439. In that case, here's the, here was the residual amount of crystalline drug when we took the clinical dose of OZ439 from the previous slides and milk. So we don't digest, we don't solubilize the whole dose of drug. And if we have two of the infant formulas with less fat than milk, they're not, they're not good enough either at dissolving the drug. So you, don't, you can't dissolve a clinical dose at lower fat. This infant formula, on the other hand, you can actually exceed the performance of milk at a lower fat content. So it's already better than milk is with less, less fat in there. As you can see, as we increase the fat in all cases, we can dissolve more drug. That makes sense. The most important data point is here. So at 5.7% fat with this particular infant formula, we dissolve the clinical dose of ferroquin and we dissolve the clinical dose of OZ439. So that then tells us that particular infant formula, that fat content, we should be able to get sufficient absorption to get a single dose cure. Infant formula, you can make a suspension of the drugs. So Gates Foundation have, with their partners, MMV and Sanofi, have made sachets with this particular infant formula, that particular fat content, both drugs in there, clinical dose, they've done stability studies, it's fine. They've gone and done clinical trials in Africa and Vietnam and it failed the clinical endpoint in Vietnam. So even though the pharmacokinetics would predict that we get sufficient absorption, it didn't have enough of an effect in the field in order to progress as it was. So that's the end of that story, sadly, at the moment anyway, unless they go back and discover why. But at least it shows how understanding these things and using these more advanced techniques can help us to actually progress our understanding a long way in this materials science meets pharmaceutical science area. So this was the data from before. The reason that infant formula one is better than the others is because the lipid composition is different. It's the only reason. They're all at equal fat content. They've all got phospholipid and some whey powder in there. The critical difference is the lipid composition and we know now which lipids do the heavy lifting so we can predict from the lipid composition which compounds are, um, are likely to, oh, sorry, which infant formulas are likely to be successful for which particular drugs. So I skipped the last example, there was, another, there was no data there but it's an example of using the same approach but for treatment for cryptosporidiosis that the Gates Foundation gave us some extra resource to look at. So I'll wind up there. Um, so this is the people who did the work. So most of this work was done at Monash. A little bit of what I showed was done uh, here in Copenhagen. Um, that's an evolving story for Peter. So I should have said that my position is actually across the Department of Pharmacy and Department of Food Science. It's meant to be roughly two thirds, one third. Um, and so these are the people who, Anna was a PhD student at the time, she loves her milk. Um, funding obviously from Gates Foundation and from these guys and um, Arla who's sponsoring Peter's PhD here in Copenhagen. So hopefully I've taught you a little bit more than you already knew walking in this room about milk, infant formula and interactions with drugs and I'm happy to take questions obviously. And hopefully that wasn't too fast and too Australian. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>